Hello, everyone. I think it's now half past, so I shall get going. So I'm going to come and talk to you about data catalogues today. I'll try and be very brief on the intro. Um, I've been working in largely in financial services for the last 20-odd sort of years, worked both as a consultant and in a line organization from doing sort of data analyst role through to setting architecture strategy. And I, I've come across uh, the same themes over and over again, and I got really frustrated, and I thought, okay, me and a couple of partners decided, let's leave the bank and let's go and build something and a business and an offering that we think tackles some of the challenges that we see in large, typical financial organizations. So I am proud to be part of a sort of fintech startup, so very early days. So I'm going to talk you through how I see the data catalog landscape, where we fit into it, and really going to try and be thought provocative about um, there's a different way of doing things. So I'm going to t tell you a story through a series of experiences that I've had and my colleagues have had through our, our careers to try and bring it to life rather than just saying, here's one type of catalog versus another. So here goes the story. So um, the data catalog market is um, kind of it's seen as being a, one of the big growth areas, forecast to grow sort of 22% per year. You can see there are some pretty big numbers. So it's an area that's getting a lot of attention. Um, there are a couple of cases where you've got Alation. They're sort of one of the new kids on the block. They've had like sort of $32 million of startup money going into them. Waterline, another one, sort of data, data lake catalog. Um, I think it was at 46 million or 23 million. Big ID, which is a GDPR based data catalog, 36 million. So there's a lot of interest in the data catalog space. Gartner have um, come up with three broad, broad categories of catalogue. There's the enterprise level that helps typically CDOs for people who sat in on the Calibra demonstra um, presentation. So very much focused on the enterprise-wide view of data. There's then various data, data catalogue, uh, data lake catalogues that help you catalogue data as it comes into the lake. And then the third category is a more vendor specific. So if you have a BI tool, then they will catalog what comes into your BI tool. They will have a catalog for, I don't know, for SAP type data. So very much so solution specific. I would actually argue that there's a further subcategorization as well. But I, I think you can see from this, it's quite a big crowded, murky market where there's multiple things going on and there's no, no such thing as a single data catalogue. So I want to tell you a story about um, a sort of a financial services use case. So this isn't a, um, this isn't a, a real, real bank because we could get in a lot of trouble for telling the sort of things I want to tell you. This is a, a fictitious example, but it's based on the truth and people who have worked in financial services will recognize many of these types of stories. So I want you to meet Jane. She is the head of financial anti-crime and um, a new regulation has just landed on her desk, um, which is not a, a new thing in, um, in, in the banking world. Um, I think financial services, along with nuclear and healthcare, are the three most regulated industries in the world. So it's, the regulator really does impose a lot of um, pressure and pain on financial services institutions. So this regulation called um, Part 504 has just landed on her desk. And that's basically saying for anti-money laundering, you need to be able to demonstrate that you have got full control of your AML processes and you know that the different, um, tran your transactions are being monitored appropriately for financial anti-crime. Now we're in the Nordics here, so you may be familiar with Danske Bank, who are in a bit of trouble at the moment because there is a whole series of transactions from the Baltics that sort of managed to miss their control systems. HSBC got fined um, I think it's $1.9 billion for failed money laundering controls in the US. So we're talking about big stakes if Jane here is not able to get in control of the data landscape and be able to demonstrate that she understands 
um, that all of the transactions are going through the appropriate transaction monitoring systems. So Jane's fairly, she's got her bit of neck on the line, so um, the, the worst per possible penalty for Jane, if she doesn't get this right, is she goes to jail. And regulators are looking to make examples. So she's fairly incentivized to get to the bottom of this. So I now want you to meet Henrik. He's been given the job of getting in control of uh, and, and helping Jane with her sort of essentially data lineage question, which is, please can you demonstrate to me that all of our transactions are going through appropriate AML control systems? Now, he's been in the bank, Henrik's been in the bank for 10 years, so he knows a bit about the history. He knows that it's a global bank, so there are operations in multiple jurisdictions. He understands that there are literally thousands of different IT systems that are in there. It's a complete spider's web of interfaces. So when we hear the story about we can just put the data in the data lake and then we can take it out and analyze it, that's a bit of a challenging prospect in the financial services world because you've got the equivalent of all the arteries all joining everything up. So it, the reality is that's a kind of a distant dream if ever we could get there. So we've got a very complex landscape. The other thing that um, Henrik knows is there have been countless other projects that have gone on within the bank to try and um, solve similar types of problems around understanding what the data landscape looks like. So as part of Henrik's job, he's going to go out and meet some of those people to understand exactly what state they're in and what kind of um, tactical and strategic solutions have been taken in order to understand those data flows. So, first person Henrik goes to speak to is he goes to find Mark who's responsible for the GDPR program. So clearly Mark is quite interested in um, data privacy and making sure there's appropriate use of um, personal data within the organization. So Mark talks through the, um, the journey that they went on and it was like, okay, GDPR, that means we need to define what our personal data is. So how do we define that? So let's go look in the, the corporate catalogue, see what is personal data. And there's already different rules around how personal data can be kept. Certainly, um, when you look here in the Nordics, there's a lot of rules around what data is allowed to be shared between the Nordic countries, which creates challenges locally around cross-border movement. Um, when you go out to, to the Far East, you'll find that Malaysian, certain Malaysian products aren't allowed to be viewed by people in Hong Kong, for example. So you've got a lot of complexity in how the landscape exists. Um, but the way the GDPR team did it is they, they, they sort of pondered for quite a while as they tried to work out which way is up. And then they said, I know, let's get in the consultants. So they spent about 25 million euros having brought in, first of all, one of the big four, and then the second one of the big four, and they sent out spreadsheets to all of the different system owners. And it's like, where do we find the system owners? Let's go and have a look in the architecture repository. And they looked in the archi architecture repository and they found all of the applications. And as they were going through, they went, hold on, he's left, he's left, he's left. And so again, the application register wasn't up to date. So they had to get the application register up to date. They had to find the relevant owners. They sent spreadsheets out to them and said, please, can you tell us if you have any of the following types of data? And they got all this data came back in spreadsheets and went, oh, what do we do with it now? So they sort of thought, I know, let's build a solution. So they kind of managed to, by hook or by crook, get the data um, into a database and then put a bit of click view type nice glossy reporting on the front and hey they've got it we are now GDPR compliant we have got our first data catalog that tells us what personal data is where in the bank it's like okay brilliant that sounds like a really good starting point for us so does that mean you can tell me how that data moves from A to B so when a customer is onboarded how that data goes from the onboarding system to, for example, the credit card system. Oh, no, 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 we can't tell you that. We can tell you that there's some personal information in the customer onboarding system, 
and we can tell you there's some personal information in the credit card system. And we can tell you in the credit card system there's a name and an address and there's some transactions. And in the CRM system we can tell you that there's a name, address and the products they've bought. But I can't tell you which customers are there. Okay, so your data catalog, it's a catalog of sort of processing activities, but it's sort of the way it was when you captured the data. Yeah, that's right. So we're now trying to, what Mark's now trying to do is he's trying to operationalize the process to try and keep that data that costs about 20 million euros in consulting fees to collect, updated, and keep it so when the inspectors come, they go, look, we've got a data catalog. So, okay, good. So, can you tell me who else I could go and speak to who may be able to help me understand sort of what information is where? So, Mark suggested, why don't you go and speak to the data sourcing team? So, meet Sarah. She's from the data sourcing team. So, she, Sarah is responsible for operating a lot of the sort of what you could call data hubs. So, um, Sarah has got some good old fashioned data warehouses across multiple platforms. She's got Teradata, she's got Oracle, she's got, you name it, she's got data warehouses on a platform. And guess what? She's also got a new data lake as well. So, um, what, what Sarah explains is, so for the data lake, um, we started the project because we needed to have a data lake and everyone has to have a data lake. And so we started building our data swamp and we realized it was getting a bit swamp-like. So we went out and we bought a data catalog. And so now we've got a process where as data is ingested into the catalog, sorry, into the, the data lake, um, we, we're able to catalog it. So now we can go in and we can see what data is inside our data lake. It's, there's a lot of work to do to, to get it updated, but we've got a very specialist tool that helps us understand the content of our lake. Um, she also is responsible for, say, the, the, the data warehouses. And so for the data warehouses, the way the, the data is catalogued is there are a series of um, sort of, if you want to call them, interface specs. So they're, they're essentially Excel spreadsheets where it has literally source to target mapping. So it's, it describes what the fields of a given inbound interface are. And there's a, a bit of a metadata description of what that data is. And, what's, and what Sarah explains is the biggest challenge is actually populating these fields. Because you get a data feed that comes in and you can have a data profiling tool or you can have machine learning and it can go through and it can identify this is a date. And you're going, brilliant, thanks. This is an address. Wow, thanks. But is that a loan start date or a loan end date? Is that a contract date? What, what sort of date is it? So yes, these machine learning type cataloging tools can help, but the big challenge is we need to get the people who understand the data to be able to fill in the catalog. And that's a huge change effort. And we can go out and buy the best catalog in the world, but it's not going to change our challenge here, which is actually finding the people who really understand the data. So, so what Sarah, one of the things Sarah has been looking at is, can we actually migrate all of these Excel spreadsheets into a tool to make it more efficient? Um, and, and, and Sarah's been kind of on, ongoing with this project and they've looked at different tools, but they've realized the biggest challenge really is the maintenance of the data and, and the tool isn't going to make too much difference in the scheme of things. The other thing that, um, that is a challenge for Sarah is the, the actual processing of data as it goes through the warehouse. So there's been loads of ETL that has been written that transforms data as it goes through. And um, it starts off using kind of a, an ETL tool to start off with. Then they use EL, sort of ELT, so it's sort of actual store procedures, and sometimes a little bit of Java code. And there's quite a lot of lookups to third-party tables. And they came up with a hypothesis. Why don't we extract all of that metadata, all of those store procedures, and load it into our data catalog? 
and that way we'll be able to look to see exactly how all of the data lineage looks within our data warehouse. It, it, its plan couldn't fail. So they did this work, they spent about half a million euros doing the work, and, and when they looked at it, they, they discovered something amazing. They discovered how complicated it really is. Because they'd look at a, a customer identifier, with a customer ID field, and then all of a sudden it went out like this. And that was at size 0 0.01 font. Because every single interface that came in to the data warehouse had a customer identifier on it. So what you could see from a lineage point of view was that every feed went into a customer ID field. It's like, great, I now understand the lineage of my data warehouse. And th the challenge was that it didn't actually help her developer teams. Sarah's developer teams were still going in and looking at the, um, the store procedures or looking at the ETL solution. Um, and, but it, it was something that the data governance guys said, yes, this should work and we should be able to tick the box for when the, the regulator comes knocking to show that we're in control of our lineage. So there's, there's again, a lot of challenges that Sarah's had where she's, sort of, she's seen the solution by, that's been offered, but then finding out the, the reality and the complexity of the situation and the data landscape is far bigger or broader than anyone really anticipated. So Sarah's, Sarah's mindset now is what we need to do is we need to make sure that we have self-documenting processes, so such as the, the data lake examples. As data is ingested, we need to catalog it at, at the time. If we try doing after the event work, it becomes very, very challenging. So Sarah is still sort of juggling, trying to work out how to do this, but it really is now down to her to focus on kind of her, her processing activities. The second, so, so, so the question, one of the questions Henrik asked Sarah as well is, so do you actually understand where, what data is coming from where? You've got your processing factory here, your, your, and you, you've got data coming in and you've got data going out. Can you tell me what data comes from where and who's using that data? And she says, okay, well, what we do have is we've got some service level agreements which we have with our, our data providers and our data consumers. And those are all stored in our um, corporate um, data catalog. It's like, good. So, so you're able to see what the service levels are. Yep, we are good. But our, our weakness with that is that we don't actually know what the content of the data is. So we've got a, an interface agreement that says these are the 30 fields that is due to come in. And we know it's due to come in at seven o'clock in the morning, but when it comes to what products, what legal entities are we expecting to find in that data, that's, that's not really clear because that's a bit of a moving feast. So we've got a sort of an IT view, but we don't really have a data view of the content. So the next person that Henrik goes to speak to is Juan, the chief data officer. So the first thing that Juan tells Henrik is, do you know what Chief Data Officer, CDO, stands for? And he said, no, what's that? And he said, career destroying opportunity. So um, Juan, our CDO, he's, he's focused on a few things. One is um, he's responsible for managing the overall um, corporate taxonomy and the, the glossary of terms in the bank. And so he's got a, um, a catalogue that has, has the glossary. And the, the glossary is by no means a, a simple thing because Juan worked out that if you were to look at all of the terms that are in use in the bank, there'd be about 34 million. By the time you look at every single field in every source system through to every single sort of attribute, in a report, there's around 34 million or so. So the idea of trying to catalogue everything is is a bit of a non-starter. So what what Juan is focused on is making sure at least they can cat catalogue the some of the the risk CDEs, some of the risk uh, critical data elements. So he's got a, a reasonable view as to some descriptions of some of the key risk um, terms, and um, what. That they try doing is, is again, is, is trying to build up a corporate view of the end-to-end -end, 
um, landscape and trying to bring all metadata into one single solution. And, and they, they really concluded our, our best strategy here is we have some terms and we publish them as a service and then we have local data catalogues that are dotted around that Sarah's team uses and they then subscribe to those terms. Now, the, the hard bit, the really, really hard bit that Juan explained was um, how you actually develop that process for managing the terms and the creation of new terms and th that mapping process. Because whenever a new term is introduced, then you need to have a push down mechanism that requests that that term be mapped by the relevant teams that look after the catalogues, those federated catalogues. And at the same time, if as part of the federated activity, they then find a term that needs to be promoted up, the up to the, the glossary, then they need to have that process that comes the other way. So as a technical team discover the need for a new term, they need a process for managing the, kind of the, the identification of the term through the publishing of the term. So what should not be underestimated, and again, Juan's key takeaway here from the data catalogue is when you start planning the implementation of glossary, don't underestimate the change management process for maintaining that glossary of terms and how it relates to each of those individual sort of technical metadata catalogues. So um, Juan, so kind of the, the other focus that Juan has as CDO is a focus on analytics. Um, so his team, he's got some data scientists. So they're a big user of the data lake um, and, and they're desperately trying to find whatever data they can for a, a given problem. So they tend to have access to all of these different data catalogues all, all over the bank and they're trying to pick and choose. And clearly one of their big frustrations is the poor levels of metadata. But it's, again, they all recognize this is a huge challenge to try and overcome. So the next person who Henrik goes to meet is Amy, who's the head of regulatory data. So. Um, her focus, so where um, Henrik and Jane's focus is more on the AML processing and making sure all transactions are being processed. Amy's really at the, the other end, which is, okay, we've got the likes of FATCA reporting, which is tax reporting. We have um, other kind of liquidity reporting that goes out of the bank. She's, her job is to, to understand what all of these different types of reports are and to start understanding where there are differences between these different reports. Um, I think somebody in the other room talked about, I think the, the guy from Calibra talked about, you can look at a sales number and there are three different versions. In, this is happening in the banking world with different metrics that are used, but the regulators are now saying, can you explain to me why these numbers are different? And so what Amy has, has done is she's worked on, on a new strategy, which is about understanding what are the macro level data flows. So she explains that the, the big drivers in, in banking from a data point of view is understanding what is the risk bearing entity that we're talking about, because there are different regulations for different risk, risk entities, and what is the product. That we're, that we're talking about. Because if you can just understand those two pieces of information, then you can start looking at one report versus another report. And at least at a macro level, you can say, well, the reason they're different is this one has only got these products, and this one's only got these legal entities. So you can start explaining away some of the really big ticket differences. And what they've done is they've put in place a, a solution that um, whenever data is distributed and received between the different um, parts of the organization, they re it reads the data and is able just to provide a snapshot, say this is what the content of the data that flowed from the loan system to the finance system was. Just looking at the legal entity and the product and at the same time saying it's financial information or it's transactions, it's cash flows. So they have it. They've been able to build out this picture of the t the overall landscape um, to help Amy actually understand what the main differences are at a macro level. And then what Amy does is she pushes the responsibility for understanding the kind of the intra application 
down to the individual system owners. So we've got a sort of a bottom up with the application owners and a top down with Amy and her, her data landscape management view. So what's Henrik learnt then? So Henrik goes back to brief Jane then and says, right, the th the, my key learnings from my exercise, having been to speak to all these stakeholders, is there is no one size fits all solution. Because of the different types of technologies we have in the bank, because of the different types of operations we have in the bank, we have to accept that there are going to be multiple types of catalog out there. But what we do need is a strategy for bringing them together to be able to help us understand a holistic picture. Um, the second thing is that it starts with the data definitions. We need to be able to have a consistent way for describing our data. And the good news is, from the work that's gone on in the Chief Data Officer organization in Juan's area, we're actually a good way for doing in a good way forward on that. But we do need to try and keep it simple and understand essentially where our haystacks are, where the major flows of data are before we start drilling in to try and understand where there are individual coding errors within an individual system. So that's really kind of our strategy needs to be to understand the top down. And then once we understand the top down, we can then start figuring where we need to go into detail and start probing around individual ETL rules, essentially. Um, and the third learning is we need to understand data in motion as well as data at rest. Apart from Amy, all of the other data catalogs that were out there were all focused on a static view of the data landscape. And the truth is the data landscape changes during the course of the day, the week, the month. So at the beginning of the day, then a lot of the trading happens and people are entering positions. At the end of the day, you have the financial close process. So there's a lot of data that's moving towards finance. And then during the night is when you start starting to build up all your reporting and, and aggregating and consolidating for the kind of the open the next day. So you have end of day reports on the desk. So you need to understand kind of that data isn't just a static thing. So, and again, for the financial anti-crime, we need to be making sure that we can see what data is going where. And the fact the landscape changes, we can't just rely on a metadata approach. So as we migrate our trading, our FX trading from one old version of Wall Street to another version of Wall Street, we need to make sure that we can see that those trades are still going through the right control systems. So. There's a lot of work to do, but we think that we've got a strategy. So that's, that was my way of trying to bring to life how there are multiple catalogs out there and they serve different purposes. I've now kind of back to the sort of away from Jane and Henrik and Juan. Um, this is how I'm seeing sort of the data catalog space really is we start off when we have glossaries and standards that, that is the fundamental building block for a common language that we can use to describe our data. Then we need to have the, what I'm phrasing a business metadata catalog, where you can capture things like your service level agreements, things like your policies, things like your, who are your data owners, who are your data stewards, who are the people responsible for data. And then we need technical metadata catalogs. We need kind of the data scientists need to be able to know where to find certain key attributes. But we know also the thing that's missing from the kind of from the market today is what I've called the data driven catalog. And this is the scenario that I explained that Amy has, which is about being able to track and actually watch data as it moves around the landscape. So that's the thing that we've been building at Data Tenor is a solution that fits in that middle layer that helps you understand from a top-down view what your data flows actually look like. Because when you can start understanding for each of your main interfaces, what data does it include, not looking at each of the 300 fields, but based on two or three dimensions, then you can start using machine learning and saying, how's that changed? 
So the focus is on building a baseline of what our data landscape looks like. Then you can start managing change to it and identifying where anomalies exist. We've built the solution on a sort of cloud-based cloud -based solution using sort of Snowflake and AWS at the moment. And we're looking for, we're looking for our first customer who wants to work with us to take it live. But I believe that there is a gap in the market there to help understand that um, the, the data in motion side and not trying to cover all, say, 40 to 34 million attributes. Um, the, way, the way that we've architected the solution is we have a, what we call smart agent. And so that's the equivalent of our IoT device that you put out on each of the data distribution and receive points. And it's a Java, it's a Java client, and it's got a command line, and it reads the metadata that you find in your Calibra or your IGC solution to tell you where you find those two or three keys of, key pieces of information, so your product and your legal entity and your type of data. And then it writes, whenever data moves, it passes the data, looks at those attributes, and sends the distinct list of values into the catalog. When it's in the catalog, we then run machine learning and AI in order to build up a baseline as to what normal activity looks like. We also use machine learning and AI to, to, do, uh, to join a receive and a distribute event. So you could say, oh, we can see the lineage. We can now see this data originated here and it's now gone over to a separate point over there. So you can actually start seeing where the actual data is flowing. And then we have a user interface and workflow that sits on the front that enables you to visualize that data lineage so you can actually see where your data is moving. And again, one of the things that a lot of you, you will experience is what we affectionately call data theft, where somebody goes, ah, oh, there's an interface. Let's reuse it. I, I can use that in my process. So this actually enables you to see where all those different points are that are using an interface where a, a data owner, the system owner of the data, may not be aware that these people actually have the data. So one great story I heard is during the financial crisis back in 2008, um, having to rerun the liquidity systems, liquidity reporting, because um, there's a financial crisis, money's going out the bank. Every time the liquidity process was being run, it was sending data out, but they didn't know where the data was going. It was actually going to payments. So every time they ran their liquidity reports, they were then trying to make payments out of the bank. So how to make a bad situation worse? With our solution, you'll be able to see the knock you'll be able to see where your data's going so it can prevent those types of errors from occurring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.